we could shift gears. Let's go to Germany with with a um, a failed art student, right? All right, we will start in 1919 since we don't have to do the whole uh, the whole lead up after World War One. So we start in 1919 with the proto Nazi Party, officially called the German Workers Party, the DAP. Uh, and this was not formed by Adolf Hitler. This was formed by, I cannot remember his name, but it was a, sort of like a locksmith guy or some, something along those lines. Some, some guy who uh, Hitler very quickly kind of pushes out of the spotlight and kind of takes over. So, um, but that's the party that Hitler and a lot of uh, disenchanted World War I veterans in Germany join. Um, this is also the same year that Rosa Luxemburg is murdered. All right. So we have kind of the birth of a far right movement in Germany and the death of uh, of a leftist leader in in Germany. Read Rosa Luxemburg. Her shit's good, folks. Yes. Very good. Yes. Reformer revolution is the big yep. one. Yes. Maybe a future uh, topic. She tried to put them on a different path, the Social Democrats, and they KPD. They, yeah, they backed out. Yeah, she was murdered in coordination of the uh, Freikorps and Social Democrats. And what was the Freikorps? The Freikorps was a like a paramilitary group, kind of just used by the right. It was just a like a band of World War One vets who a lot like the Squadrismo in a way. Right, very similar to the Black Shirts. Yes, pre SA, pre SS ruffians. Yeah. I mentioned I mentioned them in the in the monologue, so I feel like we should. Have- yeah, and as far as I can remember, not necessarily under the like direction of a party apparatus in the way that all these other examples we gave. So in 1920, the the DAP is is rebranded as the German Worker, the German Workers Party is rebranded as the. Oh, it's such a long name. It's the Nazi Party. They turn into the NSDAP, <laughs> National Socialist German Workers Party. But that's not that's NSDAP is in German, and I cannot speak German, so I'm not going to do that. But when the party is rebranded, Hitler is also put in charge of propaganda of the party, so taking over the role of the leader. And and uh, it's you know the Nazi Party is Hitler's at this point. So he spends the next couple of years kind of building this up, kind of not really doing much in terms of building a movement. It's kind of just his. It's far right lunatics, but in 1923, the Nazis attempt a coup in uh, in Bavaria called the Beer Hall, Beer Hall, Jesus Christ, Beer Hall Pooch. Beer Hall Pooch. Yeah, and and it, it fails horribly. Hitler's put in jail. He's sentenced for five years. However, he's only in there for nine months. So that's another potential, you know, fork in the road. Oh, interesting. And and the thing is, is like, it's very interesting. Like, how do you get out? He was his sentence. He didn't escape. His sentence was just reduced. Oh, he spent okay. he, in the, the during the nine months he spent writing a uh, Mein Kampf, and apparently great, great there's book, like guys. a Mein Kampf. Great, check that yeah. book out. Check that shit <laughs> New out. New York mein Times Kampf. bestseller. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so yeah, apparently there is a Mein Kampf two that uh, was never released. Wait, are you serious? And yeah, I'm not fucking kidding. The sequel. Yeah. I, it, I don't think it was literally called Mein Kampf 2. I mean, that would be that would be incredible if it were called Mein Kampf 2. That would be awesome. <laughs> but it was discovered by, like, an American soldier when they were um, in, in Hitler's, like, study or something. I don't know. I can't remember if he was, like, embarrassed by it or it's just, like, I'm not ready to release it yet. But he put, <laughs> mein, his, he put his, uh, what is it called, like, manuscripts of Mein Kampf 2 in, like, a secret Nazi safe in his bunker. So it was discovered when when they lost classic, the war. Yeah. Classic secret Nazi safe. Yes. So like Marx, also a perfectionist, probably didn't want those early drafts getting out. You know, Engels had to clean up the... You know. <laughs> yeah, it's a very German thing, I guess. Well, actually, I guess Hitler's Austrian. But um, in any case, the fail of the, the pooch, or the coup, rather, it, this was like the moment that Hitler abandoned taking power by force. Uh, apparently, so uh, there was one high-ranking Nazi official who was killed in this. And I think while he was getting shot... Hitler didn't get shot himself, but in that scuffle of the other guy getting shot, Hitler dislocated his shoulder. So oh. that's, you know, battle scars, I guess. Damn. But he had also was he, he had also fought in the war. He right? actually fought, yeah. Yeah. So he was familiar with, with uh what it took. And then um so you're telling me that this dude this dude takes part in a military coup against the government and they only put him in jail for nine months. Dude, imagine doing that shit in America. Jesus. Granted, Guaido that, does that, that in Venezuela, idea. and he he's not in prison either. So, yeah, Hitler's like, I declare myself the interim president yeah. of Germany. <laughs> yeah, Hitler is currently the interim president of Venezuela. <laughs> Tries to climb yeah. over the fence of the Reichstag. <laughs> so, uh, 
I, in my timeline, I have a pretty big gap between 1923 and 1928. 1928 is the uh, election in which uh, the Nazis place ninth. And I'm, I'm looking right now at like a chart of like election results between 1920 and 1933. And I can tell you right now, looking at it, the Nazis basically saw no growth between the, the coup and the first election. In the gap you're talking about, um, that was like, they were just like sort of a party, right? And they were doing political party stuff. Yes, they were an official party kind of from the get-go as opposed to Mussolini's uh, movement. When did when did they do the 25-point plan? Do you remember? Oh, that was very early on. That was like a founding document, right? Yes. I, thought, I, I think that's like interesting to touch on. Yes, and a lot, a lot of what was in that was like not part of anything right i know that you were kind of writing things about it if you want to touch on it no no i just was like you know we we think about to what extent like we said at the beginning that fascism is a political ideology right like not really it's exactly a collection of of whatever they wanted to to have and like paxton i think makes a point to talk about the he has a a few pages on the intellectual roots right that also dakota touched on like in terms of mussolini's influences like the intellectuals he was influenced by and to the extent that they had a political program written down, that was like Hitler's and the Nazis' first political program that they actually like released, right? Right. So he released this like twenty-five point plan um, that talked a lot. Talked. It might be in the footnotes of the book too. There's like some interesting stuff in there, but he it essentially just throws it in the trash. Yeah, exactly. On. And like, and um, there's a, a Mussolini quote where he's like asked about his program, and he says, "My program is that we want to govern Italy." Right. He has no <laughs> particular policies that are like, "This is my cornerstone." Like, it's just about taking power. And and the economics comes from the political, right? That if he doesn't have an economic plan, the the economy is just whatever he needs it to be to respond to the political goals that they have, right? Yeah. Yes. And I think the most important thing to take away from both of them is both of their anti-capitalist rhetoric is nonsense. When they're just trying to get elected, they use anti-capitalist rhetoric because that's very like hot and in at the time. Yes. But in their governance, they're extremely capitalist. It's almost like it's it's like almost like the one the one thing they understood was how to get power. Yes. <laughs> yep. Which we which is like, uh, you know, I don't. I don't want to get into a space where I'm like, you know, putting them on a pedestal or something or like making it seem like they're cool or whatever. But like Mussolini also does have that totally like big dick reply to the reporter or whatever. Who's like, uh, well, mm, sir, tell us about your uh, your uh, party platform or like your plan. And he's like, the ju- what does he say? Like the journalists from El Mundo want to know our party program. Our party program is to break the bones of the of the journalist at El Mundo <laughs> as quick as quickly as possible. Right. Jesus Christ. And I was just like, damn. That, that reminds is... me of um of Maduro fucking with Jorge Ramos when he's like, you will swallow your provocations with a Coca-Cola or something. <laughs> okay. I didn't even know about that. <laughs> uh, that's a classic interview. It is sad. I mean, unfortunately, we on the left cannot be use identical tactics because we do have a coherent ideology in which we cannot just Good say point whatever we need, and we will not be reinforced by capital at every step of the way. But it is worth taking a look at how these people got to power, right? Yeah, I, I kind of touched on it when we were introing. Like, there's two ways to look at researching and studying fascist organizing tactics, and one is to, like, know your enemy. But another one is also, too, to, like, kind of learn lessons and see, like, okay, how can we use maybe some of their, like, more vague organizing tactics that can be applied in a, with a leftist agenda. Interesting. But I'll continue with my timeline. <laughs> For sure, yeah. Uh, so we're back at 1928, right? Correct. And they placed ninth okay. in the elections. And then between 1928 and 1932, the Nazis go from placing ninth to placing first. Hey, this is Patrick from the future. I just uh, realized that I left out a pretty big detail. The Nazis went from ninth place to first place between 1928 and 1932, uh, primarily because of the Great Depression. Uh, that was the main driving force in their increased popularity. So I just kind of wanted to put that out there. All right, back to the show. So they uh, they won about, like was it like 30-something, 30 34% uh, in the parliament. So they didn't have a clear majority. That's like a classic thing that people always say. It's like, oh, the Nazis didn't, you know outright win any elections but the thing is like in germany nobody outright outright wins any elections because they're a multi-party uh system yeah but they did win uh a plurality so i would say that is stage two they're rooting in the political uh system 
of the five stages of uh, fascism. And then we're kind of on a crash course going through the stages from that point. Paxton touches on this, that like, as a fascist movement, they deflate just as quickly as they inflate. So they need to seize and like codify their power immediately, or they'll kind of just peter out. And as we can see with the Nazis, in 1933, January, I have to use the months now because this all happens within like three months, uh, Hitler is appointed Chancellor of Germany. In February of the same year is the Reichstag fire, which, because of the uh, the, the, the chaos that ensues and like the, the threat of communism, I believe the, uh, the person who was um, convicted of doing that well, accused and I believe convicted was like a, a Dutch communist. So it's kind of a legitimization of the Red Scare hysteria in Germany. And also like, it, it, like another thing. Okay, we're going to talk about forks in the road, right? Like, uh, and this was literally like a match thrown onto a big, you know, vat of gasoline or whatever. I wonder like if this hadn't happened, because... It, you know, it, it was seemingly it, not random, but like, you know, a crisis that kind of came out of nowhere. Uh, if this hadn't happened, you know, what would the alternate timeline look like? It was like the most, con well, I'll get into what I'm going to say and then I'll, I'll come back to that. So the next thing that happens in March because of the fire was the Enabling Act, which allowed uh, Hitler to act without the, the without the Reichstag, kind of just basically becomes the dictator of Germany. And so going back to that, I believe personally that like that was just the most convenient thing at the time, but I think there would have probably been something else that he would have used kind of in a similar way, like how the U S goes to war. Like they always kind of like either make up or make someone attack them so that they can go to war. Like, Oh, you cut off Japan's oil. Of course they're going to Pearl Harbor. Oh, Pearl Harbor happened. Let's get into war or, you right. know, let's blow up our own uh, ship in Cuba and go to war with Spain or, you know, that kind of, that kind of stuff. Uh, the Gulf of Tonkin incident, I actually didn't know this until I read the book, but the Enabling Act was a, a law that kind of had to, had to be re-upped every four or five years. So it's not that he became dictator for life. However, there was always a kind of a good excuse, I mean, in their terms, a good excuse to extend the Enabling Acts, uh, especially once the war started. Uh, and you ban all other political parties, right? You can just... Yes. Yeah, yeah there were kind no more an, elections after that. Kind of an interesting example like early example of wielding a power that was still constrained by existing political and legal mechanisms, not to the full extent of just being like a one party dictatorship that just does whatever it wants, but still sort of take like giving people the courtesy of like at least passing a law. Right. Yeah. Yes. Hitler um, took power legally. Yeah. Like the, almost like the Patriot Act, a much stronger version of the Patriot Act, you know, where, mm -hmm. The yeah. government would already do all this stuff. They just need this thing, this piece of paper to, you know. Yeah, to legitimize it in yeah. the eyes of the public. And, and again, uh, he was, did you cover that, is this, did he already become chancellor at this point? Yes, he was already chancellor, um, but. And how he, did that happen? He was appointed by uh, President Hindenburg. Okay. So it was kind of a similar situation uh, in like the, two, the dual power in Italy where it was, there was like the king and then the PM, except for in Germany, it was the president and the PM or in the chancellor rather. And that was another, uh, another example of sort of like a backroom deal where, uh, he, the guy who appointed the, him, ha, uh, someone else like owed him a political favor or something. And it was like, there was a lot of like backroom sort of shuffling of, of, uh, power going on. Yeah. And the backstairs you know, conspiracy. Yeah. Yeah. I do know that like basically what had happened is the conservatives knew that the Nazis had like a popular movement and they were terrified of communists. So if they were going to fight the communists, they needed to have a popular movement. So uh, that was like why they originally decided to co uh, coalition with the Nazis. Additionally, just another Paxton quote is uh, that fascists are like a private anti-communist military for conservatives and capitalists. Very convenient. Yeah, because capitalists don't want to be doing the fighting themselves. Right. But we see, like, with control of uh, government transferring over to the Nazis, uh, not a coup, not a, uh, you know, um, you know, not a violent incident, uh, cooperation with existing elites, which right. is a recurring theme. Yeah. Right. And, yeah, I guess I don't want to, like, blow our load too early and stuff, but there are so many packs and quotes that come to mind when I'm just thinking about this, like, two-year period. Oh, cool. Yeah, go for it. 
Well, I'm totally having a brain fart now, so I have to. <laughs> well, okay, so I think we're. Go ahead. I'll just say, yeah. I mean, it's kind of interesting because in in America we have this unitary executive branch, and so um, you'd almost have to imagine the equivalent would be like if you know the RNC just sort of like you know annulled their own primary and handed it to some other candidate. You know. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, like what might happen in the next couple of months. <laughs> well, well, yeah, we don't. Yeah, <laughs> with Biden. <laughs> yeah. So, so yeah. Just going back to what Paxton was ha- the the thing that I was going to say that I just had a brain fart on. Basically, pure fascist movements are impossible because fascists need to seize power through coalition with existing apparatuses and existing parties. Usually, or almost always, conservatives and capitalists. And the degree to which the fascist dynamic exists in that country is is basically like the ratio of fascist to non fascist belligerence in that coalition. So this is my made up kind of percentages of it. But like I would describe Hitler's fascist movement in or fascist governance in Germany to be like 80 percent fascist, 20 percent conservative, where like Mussolini is like 60, 40. Got it. Mussolini like Mussolini literally got fired by the king, you know. So that's just a case right there that the conservatives had more sway in Italy. So also in March, immediately after the Enabling Act, the first concentration camp opened in Dachau. And who were the first sent there? They were Marxists and socialists, of course. <laughs> Never fucking forget. Yep. But yeah, by the summer of 1933, Hitler's dominance over his conservative allies was completely and clearly established. In the summer of 1944, he kind of turned his, his uh, I guess, firing squad towards rivals within his fascist regime. And that, was, that came under the name of uh, Night of the Long Knives. Uh, it was in late June 1934, which made basically the SA completely subservient to the SS. There was a gentleman who uh, I believe was in charge of the SA called Ernst Röhm. He was assassinated because he was probably the biggest clear internal threat to to Hitler's dominance within the party. So, Patrick, can you can you set this up a little bit? Like, who who are the sides here, and what do they want? So, the SA is basically like the radical rank and file, like squad squadrismo type characters. Okay, who in Italy, we're constantly asking, or not asking, but like demanding further radical right. movements from Mussolini. And, you know, like, if you're not going to do it, we'll do it for you kind of deal. So I guess, uh, and I think that happened. The thing is, is like a lot of these things, if you put the Italian and the German timelines together, you can definitely see where they're each kind of learning lessons from one another. Okay. Because like the rank and file kind of forced, to a degree, forced Mussolini's hand into becoming a one party dictatorship. And I don't think Hitler wanted to have that kind of dynamic. Right. But so we have we have this sort of uh, this thing that's happening within the Nazi party itself where its most radical wing is rubbing up against like the the wing that's sort of already been subsumed into government. Um, Correct. And, and and in the light of the night of the long knives, it was like Hitler aligning closer with the military in terms of like who is who is enacting like uh, violence and force on their own populace in order to keep things in line. Hitler al- decided to align further with the military as opposed to the SA. And this was to do what, like shore up his power? Yes. Make sure that there was no internal dissent. That kind Correct. of thing. In- internal dissent and also to have any like personal threat to his power as in the form of like another person who could either be his successor but i think he was thinking more in the context of like uh his replacement probably a pretty smart move yeah one of the people who was killed in the night of long knives was gregor strasser who uh, was responsible for what's known as strasserism which was Uh. right which is one of the argue arguable i mean i wouldn't even use the term left but arguably left ish versions of national socialism where he actually talked explicitly about unions and worker co-ops and how cat we were anti-capitalist for germans and gregor strasser was taken care of at uh, at the land of the long knives so can we look at that in the context of like a war of ideas happening within the party as well yeah i mean i think it mirrors mussolini right where mussolini learned the lesson you can't deal with these syndicalists they're a drag on you you know you got to get cozy with business. At the end of the day, like the Nazis serve to protect capital. So you can't have somebody who's <laughs> saying like, you know, workers should have more power. Yeah. 
Right, which was part of the 25-point plan that the Nazis released when they were, you know, first getting the party off the ground. Yeah. yeah. You know, they they talk, they they paid a lot of lip service to the workers. So in in destro- in the Night of the Long Knives, like in destroying his internal enemies and in August, President Hindenburg dying, that left Hitler completely al- alone at the helm of uh, of the state and the party in Germany. Fast forward a year, and in September of 1935, the Nuremberg Laws are enacted. These are the anti-Jewish laws that say, you know, a German can't like have an interracial marriage with uh, a Jew, and Jews, I think, is something with employment. Like they can't. They can't hold certain jobs. They, right? yeah, they yeah. can't hold certain jobs. Yeah. Now, I I'm not sure how I kind of missed this when I was like studying history in high school and college, but. I didn't realize how late in the Nazi timeline that the Holocaust started. It didn't start until 1941, which I'll get to. But I, for some reason, I just thought it started earlier. But it was very incremental. And and Paxton does talk about this. He has an entire section, particularly on the Holocaust, how it was called the final solution because there were like three other solutions before that. But through the like the ping pong game of party and rank and file, kind of um, trying to one up each other constantly, that's what led to the final solution. Yeah. And... And at the at that point, like concentration camps were already going, right? Yeah. In thirty seven, the enabling acts are extended, and then in thirty eight is when militarization really starts, both at home and abroad. So Germany in March annexes Austria, and in October they annex the the Sudetenland, which is the German speaking part of uh, Western uh, Czechoslovakia. Uh, one month later is Kristallnacht, which is I'm sure as everyone probably knows is where uh, Jewish businesses were destroyed. And then in 1939, March 1939, Germany invades the rest of Czechoslovakia. That was kind of the last seizure of foreign land that Germany did that didn't instigate any war because in September of 39, they invade Poland and World War II begins. And thus they enter phase five. Well, phase five, part one. The war is phase five, part one. The Holocaust is phase five, part two. So in invading Poland, they sign a non-aggression pact with the Soviet Union. I'm sure that'll hold up. <laughs> and the UK declares war on, on Germany. Germany, within probably like eight months, turns around and invades the rest of Western Europe, uh, France, Belgium, and the Netherlands. And the next year, the Holocaust begins in '41. I'm kind of fast forwarding through this, so please excuse me, but uh, no it's kind of just it's kind of just war dates at this point. Yeah, yeah, I feel like also we don't really need to get too far into like the war stuff. Yeah, I'm just going to kind of just say the last couple of things. The, the and, Second and, yeah. World War happened, folks. We all, we yeah. all know yeah. about I, that. I'm pretty happened. sure we all learned yeah. about it. But, we, we, um, Nazis yeah. were bad. We've seen Saving Private Ryan. What else? Yeah. yeah. You, you, can, um, you can find more about this if uh, you are a gamer. Uh, play video games. There's a lot of them. Play, if you play Call of Duty, too. you'll basically get all of this yeah um holocaust begins in 41 germany invades the ussr 1942 under you know the umbrella of of war the enabling act is extended uh 1944 the u.s joins the western front and in 1945 hitler kills himself actually hitler gets married and then he kills himself watch that movie downfall it's about the last days of Hitler. That's the one with like the classic Hitler scene that people turn into. The like, meme, when, yeah, yeah, yeah. When your team loses in the playoffs, yeah. it's whatever. actually a great movie. But it's, it's everyone should check it out. It's a great movie. But yeah, rest in piss. 